you've covered this topic for a long time and you've watched the changes in the media. Do you believe that, generally speaking, uh, there is adequate coverage of public education given the importance of the issue and the complexity of it right now? So when I came to the Chronicle uh, six years ago, we started out with four full-time K-12 reporters. Two of those were focused on, well, one of those was focused kind of on youth issues. Um, the other three were me, Jennifer Radcliffe, and another reporter who's since left covering K-12. And then we had a higher ed reporter. Today we have um, one and a half K-12 reporters and one part-time K-12 reporter and part-time higher ed reporter. Our Austin Bureau has been um, decimated. We have two or three and some interns given on a, um, depending on the day. So yeah, we're down a lot of people just like your schools are down a lot of people. We have to cherry pick stories more than we used to. Um, our news hole is smaller than it used to be. Um, but So I think we um, can do the bigger issues well, so accountability that affects multiple school districts, um, graduation plans that affects multiple school districts, um, covering the happenings in individual communities, covering what's happening in the Conroe School District, covering what's happening in the sci -Fair School District um, is something that we don't do as much as we used to do. We probably focus more on themes, which one could argue is perhaps more valuable with limited resources. Actually, the Chronicle sounds like it's doing pretty well compared to the Denver Post, which hasn't had a full-time education reporter at all for the past year. Do not tell my editors <laughs> <laughs> Compared to, it's all relative. But seriously, I just was talking to Morgan and Eric, I think they just the Post just hired a, an education reporter from El Paso to move up there and be a full-time education reporter, but it's a fairly major metropolitan area, not the size of Houston, has not had a full-time education reporter at their one surviving newspaper for over a year, so that tells you something. Um, the Education News Network actually would probably exist, I like to think would exist, even if newspapers were still as strong as they were in their post-Watergate heyday. Because our idea is that education is such an important topic and it touches everybody that covering it in a really deep way and in a way that really integrates different pieces of it um, is, is something that really needs to happen. So for instance, um, there's a lot of coverage everywhere, less now than there used to be, of education policy making, right? School boards, the state legislature, um, to some extent what happens on the federal level as well. Um, there's a lot less coverage of how those following that the, the making of that policy through to the actual implementation the rule making and then the implementation of those policies and then how those policies actually play out in district schools and even in classrooms. And that's really what we're about, is trying to not cover anything that has the name education on it, but what are those really important issues that have risen to the level of policy and then how those play out all the way through to what happens and how it affects children in classrooms. Um, I think newspapers um, still, some newspapers still do a, a good job of covering the big issues, as Erica said. I, I think there are some great education journalists still out there, but the reality of the economic situation of the media is such that it's really hard for these issues to be covered the way they need to be, and that's what the Education News Network is all about. So we, rep just really briefly, we represent the coming together of two five-year-old nonprofit education news websites, the one I started in Denver uh, five years ago, and one called Gotham Schools in New York. Um, we've come together, created a national organization, and are now working on an expansion strategy, and one of the places we really want to come is to the greater Houston area because of everything that's happening here and how interesting a place it is um, for education. So we're working on that. Um, in general, uh, the state of you know, I've kind of gone over what I think the state of education coverage is. I think that I have a great deal of optimism about the future because of organizations like the, the Texas Tribune and what they've been able to do. And you know, this, they're, they're who the Education News Network wants to be when we grow up in terms of the way they've managed to diversify where they get their funding from, the incredible talent they've been able to hire, um, and the reputation they've been able to establish, the partnerships they've been able to form. Um, so I, it gives me hope to see them. I just was in Berkeley, California this week hanging out with the Center for Investigative Reporting, which is another top flight nonprofit news organization that's really making a go of it. And I think you're gonna see more of this kind of organization start to emerge over time. 
just regardless of what happens with newspapers. And, and as long as people can learn where to go to get that kind of information, um, I think journalism is going to be in a better place in some ways than it ever has been before. The challenge is that it's very hard for the casual reader or web browser or phone flicker or whatever you want to call it to know the difference between something of the caliber of the Texas Tribune versus the old stereotype now of some you know somebody sitting in their mother's basement in their underwear blogging you know because it's all on the web and it all look you know it all looks typeset and everything so how do you distinguish what's real from what's not real and how do you get information that tells you the truth as Evan was saying as opposed to a very skewed one-sided perspective. Who do you imagine the consumer these days of, of that story is? Is it a regular person? Are you writing for the average Texan who goes into the conversation not knowing anything about these debates? Or are you writing for a more elite and more aware audience than the average person? I try to really s to strike a balance between those two because, I mean, there's no point to writing a story if it's not something that a regular person can't walk into and read and understand what's going on. but in order to have credibility, in order to have an authority about it, it has to be done in a way where the people who do know what's going on, who are following these issues closely, are going to be able to look at that and, and feel like that, it's, that it accurately reflects the situation. How do you avoid essentially being spun or contributing to the spin in your report? Well, I think part of that is making sure that you, that you seek out a diverse variety of sources who, you know, both the people that are vocally about, vocal about their opinions on the subject, but also trying to find people who are affected by the issue in question that might not be as vocal about it, because those can often tend to be kind of the closest to, can tend to reflect the closest to the truth about the situation. And then, you know, I think the other thing, and, and this is something that is kind of an interesting discussion on education reporting is is trying to seek out people who don't have who are informed about the issue but don't have some kind of vested interest in whatever the outcome is and sometimes when you're, you're going about the business of reporting a story on education it, it can be really difficult to to reach people like teachers because of the bureaucracy imposed by districts or parents because it, because you know, it's hard to just call up a parent in a school district. I mean, that involves, you know, actually going to school board meetings, to talking talking to people at hearings. And that's something that requires time and an effort and something that I think is something that is very important in, in the course of reporting. Piggybacking off what Morgan said about um, finding a diverse group of sources and being able to get people to tell their story, um, when Evan was talking about the school funding cuts, I, this was one of my more frustrating reporting moments um, before, what was it, the year the school funding cuts kicked in, would have been 10, 11? Yeah. Time is flying. Okay, so 10, right before the 10, 11 school year, my editor said, let's do a story on how the school budget cuts are actually going to affect schools before the students return to school. And so I called a bunch of school districts in the area. The way the bureaucracy works, you generally call their PR person. Um, and I would say the large majority said to me, well, we're just going to make it work for the kids. I said, well, that, that's great. I'm sure you're going to make the schools work for the kids. But I keep hearing that these budget cuts are awful doom and gloom. Can you give me some specifics about how students are going to be effective? I had a really hard time um, pulling out specifics. I eventually was able to talk to some school principals who could say, well, we cut our librarian and so we have a, someone who's not a specialist or we're not going to be able to offer a newspaper as an elective course anymore, um, which you know, hit home for me. But um, I found that school districts either one had a, either a difficult time telling their story or two, had a reluctance to speak what they saw as maybe something negative that that would make their school um, or district look bad. Um, so I, you know, was able to sort of pull it out of folks, but um, I think there's some value in being able to tell your story, whether it's good um, or bad. It is almost always the case, it's a cliche because it's true, 
that the squeaky wheels get the grease. And there are on all of these topics squeaky wheels, whether it's empower Texans and Texans for fiscal responsibility on the question of school finance or TAMSA on the question of accountability and testing to pick two groups that are on diametrically opposite ends. You know, we tend to see the same people quoted in these stories over and over, and I wonder how we break from that and try to find a more representative point of view on all these topics, not just the people who tend to stand up first and wave their hand until you call them. You know, one thing on the squeaky wheels, sometimes they are the most informed, or at least they are informed about an issue, um, even if they have you know, the predictable opinion. Um, when you're just trying to call parents on an issue, um, one of my little tricks, I get a database of all the parents in HISD who don't opt out of the directory. So if you have kids and you don't want to talk to reporters, you should opt out of the directory. Um, though they've clamped down on that. Um, but when you call up the average parent, which is who you ultimately want to know, how is this affecting the kid at school, so you try and call their parent, you know, parents today, they're working, they're busy, they're not going to the legislature, they're not going to school board meetings, probably not reading our paper as much as we would like them to. You spend a lot of time sort of spelling out the issue to them and then um, getting their opinion, which is fine, but it, it shows sort of the difficulty of getting that everyday opinion. And um, classroom teachers, we were having a conversation before this started. I often joke that I want to carry a copy of the First Amendment with me and remind teachers that they are allowed to speak. And um, covering schools for as long as I have, I know the fear that teachers have of the bureaucracy and that they're going to get fired if they talk to me. But um, no one that I know of has ever been fired if they talk to me. And I always say I'd probably just write a story after you got fired for talking to me. and. You know, the power of the press, you probably would get your job back. Um, when you are trying to talk to these sources and you do have, you know, the typical maybe teachers association president or, you know, far right wing um, advocate, grassroots ad activist, um, I think that's where, you know, sometimes those might be the only people who are willing to talk to you or who are adequately informed enough on an issue to, to, to dis discuss it, but in that situation, I think the, the context becomes really important and kind of the way the issue is framed and, and the amount of information that you're able to put out there in the story where, you know, you might not be able to find someone to quote saying this is how these cuts at my school district are affecting my children, but you can put the information out there that you know, this many jobs or these kinds of jobs have been lost as a result of those cuts. Most people, often the activists on the wings, are more than happy to give you their cell phone number. <laughs> right? Sometimes uh, other people uh, aren't quite so willing or, or, uh, or able. Uh, Alan, let me ask you about the way that um, the world has changed in terms of what Erica is talking about. You know, it used to be that if you wanted to call a principal or call a teacher, you would have to go through the flack at the school district. Uh, you'd have to observe protocol, a terrible thing in the media, observing protocol. Um, the reality is we have many more ways to connect with people directly, to bypass the filter than we used to on education and on other topics. And I wonder if that has had, the tr as you view it, the transformational effect on the work that you do as it appears to me it has. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think um, the more sophisticated you get on how you use social media in particular, the more you can go around some of those protocols th through Twitter, through Facebook. You can, you can ask, sort of put questions out there and get people coming back to you. Um, you know, the mistake I think some inexperienced people might make is that they, they take something that comes back to them from Twitter and use it directly without actually then tracking the person down and verifying who they are. Um, but, but there is a greater opportunity now to get around to, to people um, in, in different, new and different ways than, than there used to be. You know, another thing I kind of wanted to piggyback on what Morgan and Erica were saying, Our, the guy we have who covers education issues in the state legislature in Colorado, um, who's very experienced, has been doing this for a long time, said that he feels, and he worked for the Denver Post as a 
reporter and editor for over 30 years before he started doing this. But he says one of the things that he feels really liberated about in doing this work is that he's, he doesn't feel as though in the sort of old newspaper tradition that he has to go get a quote from somebody to, to make a point about almost anything, that he feels like he can be, the way he, he, he uses it, he says, well, if George W. Bush was the decider, I can be the concluder, which means he, he can just, without stating an opinion, just if something's very evident that this is the way it is, he can say it without having to get attributed to a legislator or somebody else. And I think that's one way in which, in, the, in this new era, journalism can sort of shift a little bit into a new way. But, but Alan, I mean, I, I hear that, and of course I begin to seize up. Hmm. And I, I, I think that the traditional role of the press is not to be the concluder, mm -hmm. but is to give you all out in the world the means to be concluders yourselves. So wh why shouldn't this make me fear for the health of the Republic? It's not, I, I wouldn't say it's concluding that, that this is the absolute truth, but it's rather, um, it, it's the going out and having something that's evident on its face. You don't have to put somebody else's name on it. You can just say this is evident on its face. I wish I could think of a perfect example for you right now. Well, the one that I always think of is I go to bed at night, there's no snow on the ground. I wake up in the morning, there's right, snow on the right. ground. I didn't okay. see it snow, but I can say it snowed. Right, a meteor, you don't need to quote a meteorologist telling you it's snow. It, right. It doesn't take a weatherman to know which way the wind blows, to quote right. a poet. Good. First song lyric quoted today, hopefully the last song lyric. <laughs> but I enjoyed it when he's hanging with the rise of the Tea Party. A movement come together very quickly and overtake the system. Overtake the electoral system, throw people out of office, put people into office, really transform the conversation that we're having about politics in this country today. It seems to me that the pitchforks and torches that were brandished by the Tea Party are not the exclusive province of the right. And that the education community could very well pick up those pitchforks and pick up those torches if they wanted to and put on those three-cornered hats and make the same beeline for the centers of power. And that social media provides them as much of an opportunity to do so as it did the Tea Party, right? I mean, we have a new way of organizing in this country and it's called the hashtag. So I wonder if each of you would say a word about the way in which the changes in technology as they relate to the media have changed the dynamic. Well, I think you education. have seen uh, people in the education community take up social media in the same way that you might see somebody um, that's a political act activist do it. And that is, um, we saw in 2011 when the budget cuts were occurring, the Save Our Schools movement, where there was a huge rally at the Capitol and it drew people from across the state. And a lot of that happened through networking on social media. Um, another example of that is the, um, the anti-testing, or the, at the movement for meaningful testing. They don't like it if you call them anti-testing. <laughs> um, that is something that where we've seen you know, parents and educators across the state um, having gone, having experienced the, the rollout into this new assessment system, saying that the, there are real issues that we see here and we're going to have our voices heard. And that's something that also has happened on social media. Social sites. media has given um, you know people a voice who wouldn't traditionally have one. Um, I will live tweet school board meetings, for example, which is not as boring as it sounds, I promise. Um, but really it does come under the heading, as I was talking about earlier, giving people and communities information they never had access to before. Yeah, no, I get paid to sit at a school board meeting. I may as well stay awake um, <laughs> tweeting and telling you when I'm hungry. Um, once someone offered to bring me a Diet Coke, which was really sweet. but. Um, I will have um, folks tweet me um, either publicly or through direct message who would never have taken the time to email. And I'm not quite sure I've realized that I quite get it, but I will have a school principal who may be too scared to come up to talk to me in person at the school board meeting, which I'm 5'1", not that scary. Um, but, or I'll have someone direct message me on Twitter because they're on their phone anyway and they somehow feel that they've seen my picture and I'm telling them when I'm hungry and it sort of makes the reporter seem more real and it's actually been very beneficial to me as a reporter. Um, whether I can quote them or not, it's still getting insight. Yesterday I was tossing out the question, you know, how many EOCs and in what subjects and I had several people respond. Um, granted, I'm not quoting them in a story, but it's an interesting dialogue yep. and um, 
people can tweet the superintendent directly and tell him whether you think this policy is good or bad. Um, so I've, I've seen a lot of board members you. tweet back to me during school board meetings. Now whether that's, you know, whether that means they're paying attention or not, or whether the media is becoming too much a part of the dialogue or not. Um, Maybe they're just thirsty also. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm not, I think it's like what Eric is saying is really an interesting point, which is I think that it's, it's opened up, it's made the media seem less monolithic in some ways and allowed um, people to see that the reporters are people with personalities and some, you know, I think some of the really People who know how to use Twitter well will say something like, I'm hungry, or, you know, I'm really worried that this meeting's gone on so long that my dog will have peed on my rug. Um, I've actually seen that from a legislative reporter at the Denver Post. Um, so I think, I think that opening that, it up that way is a, is a good thing. It, sometimes I worry a little bit about it actually um, increasing the polarization that we've been talking about, people getting information from only one source, because you do get Twitter groups or, or organizations that, that tweet out a lot of stuff that's pushing really hard on one agenda, and you know, if that's the only people you follow, if you're a, a Twitter person, then, then that can continue to just add to that. But overall, I think it's a really positive thing that opens, opens the world up to a, a lot of people and allows new sources of information. And the danger is if you curate your Twitter feed in such a way that all you get are the squeaky wheels, it does keep out the voices that maybe need to be added to the conversation.